Can I get a raw co roll call vote? Jane? Here. Lisa? Here. Herb? Here. Kim has a notice. Hillary? Here. Jeff? And Rebecca? Here. And Carly Stone? Here. And Jan? Here. All right. Sam for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right. Okay, so first off is our VHS student report, but now are they, do you know if they're coming today? I apologize, I just talked to them um, earlier today, Mr. Jordan, we, so I know it's going to Well, we can come back. Um, <laughs> We'll come back. Um, so next is um, Brian Smelnack with the bond update. Good evening, how are you? Good. Now that winter's back, we have to get <laughs> I know. So I wanted to um, come tonight to present a couple of things. Um, uh, so you know, the BIDPAC 3 for Harvey Swanson was awarded several weeks ago with, with the interior remodeling of the project. The uh, flooring, the painting, the cabinetry, new doors, exterior doors, and the new entrance canopy features on the front, and also re roofing the, the second half of the building, which put a building done several years ago. Uh, the next step in it was uh, the furniture selection. So we had some good news on the uh, bid pack three. We were under budget by a little bit over $800,000. So the next step in the three uh, remodeling of our response was the furniture uh, selection. And we mentioned several times, several meetings ago, that we wanted to go with a direct purchase through a cooperative bid process, a nationwide bid process, as opposed to a, a traditional bid process, uh, which means with the, with the cooperative process, we're able to go directly to furniture vendors that have already discounted furniture up to 40, 50% with some pieces. And it gives the district a better economic uh, solution. And you're also able to select your pieces as opposed to going out for bids and then just having everybody throw their comparable thing at you. So, so we went through that process. About a year ago, we organized the committee um, when Debbie was still here. And then uh, we worked through uh, the, the rest of the spring. We picked back up in September. And then uh, with several members of the staff, Hillary was on it for a while. And then we uh, basically went through and uh, room by room, and, and they told us their desires for furniture. So um, I wanted to go through just real quickly again. Here we Did you turn that on on the side. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. So uh, the furniture, uh, the rooms that we looked at furniture uh, are indicated here in the floor plan. Again, the early childhood wing is off the screen because we did not have that included in the contract for the bond issue for the early, early childhood wing. Uh, strictly for the uh, the bond act, we just had the classrooms for desks and chairs and the classrooms only. So when we went with the when we met with the committee, uh, we looked at every every room in the building because there was uh, so much more areas being used for instruction and meetings with children and so forth. Uh, we looked at every inch of the building, even the office areas and so forth. Uh, so basically everywhere you see a, a rectangle, you probably can't see, but there's letters in each of the rooms uh, that um, uh, we basically, the committee selected furniture for each of those rooms. We did not do the cafeteria. Those tables are going to stay. There was not a need to replace anything in the cafeteria. And then we didn't do anything with gymnasium either. So for the classrooms in the media center, uh, this is the grade one through five selections that were made. See the teacher desk in the upper left corner. Uh, 
the, the big thing that the committee wanted to achieve was flexibility in the seating, keeping desks and chairs and tables easily moved compared to what some of the equipment that's in there now. And I'm sure you've been in Swanson, it's a kind of a mismatch of a lot of different things for over the years. Uh, you really haven't had the opportunity to do this. So people have brought in their own things and so forth. Uh, so the teacher, the typical teacher desk, oh, this, this is, oops. Oh, it's like, they have a little, uh, little guy. Oh, it does. Okay. So the teacher desk here, the typical one. Again, you see there's a detachable piece on the end on wheels, and that raises up and down so the teacher can use that as a lectern and go around the room uh, and basically create study spaces everywhere in the room. The, the student desk was here, uh, taking on, uh, getting away from the traditional. Uh, rectangle or square shape and more of a triangular shape, which allows the desk to be used separately, or you can put it together and make several shapes. You can make rows, you can make squares, uh, two kids, three kids, four kids. It really gives the instructor flexibility to arrange their room on a daily basis um, as, to, as far as what they're instructing and what grade level they're, they're teaching. So teacher desk chairs, student chairs, uh, they really felt a, a reading table was was desirable, um, which was different from the student. You know, this is for six kids to gather around with the with the teacher, and then a, another chair for the reading table. Um, the big thing that the committee really talked about was the desk right now here that was selected does not have a storage bin underneath the desk. They felt that uh, they wanted to go into more of a, a cubby, a tote system, which is this unit here. Those doors open up. And there are several totes in there. So each student in the morning would get their tote, take it to their desk, use it during the day. At the end of the day, they put the tote back in, close the door, and they felt it was a much better opportunity to keep the room neat and clean and orderly as opposed to just having things underneath the desk. So they did a survey through the whole staff and took a, several meetings to go through, but the, uh, the uh, ultimate decision was to go to the separate totes as opposed to having storage under the desk. So that uh, that drove then you know getting the uh, ordering these units in for each of the rooms. The other thing that was a need that they don't have currently was a, a mailbox uh, unit that they felt was very important, so the kids could have their own uh, mailbox slot. Um, some other items that they that they really felt was important was the uh, teachers wanted a, a two door lateral file in addition to uh, their their unit their desk unit does have does have a file unit here in pencil drawer, but it wasn't enough storage for them. So they felt it important to have a two drawer file, uh, some additional bookcases, some book display cases, um, some fun seating. These are, these actually would be the chairs going around the, the reading table that we looked at here. Some fun seating for the, for the students here. Uh, a portable easel unit. Again, you see there's bin storage along with the ability for the uh, it's on wheels. They can just take that anywhere in the room and have a study study space or workspace. As part of impact three, each of the rooms are getting two area rugs that are movable again in the room. And then these are some discs, some pads here that the kids could put on the on the rugs to sit down and have a study time or a story time. So that's that's pretty much the arrangement in each of the rooms, grade one through five. Also, junior card, junior kindergarten, kindergarten. The difference in the, the only difference is they wanted an additional toy cart shelf here for the kindergarten room. So that's the only difference between the uh, JK, K, and one through five. They really felt it was important to keep uniformity in the chairs, the types of chairs, the colors, the bins uh, per, per room. So as the grade level changes, you know, in second grade this year, might be in third grade next year, et cetera. So, it really felt it important to keep uniformity in the chairs and the tables and the equipment that's in each room. Again, take this opportunity that we have to make things neat and orderly and all match. Again, you've probably been to Swanson, and you've seen a lot of the bookcases and things that have been brought in over the years that are different colors and uh, the staff that's had to buy their own things, unfortunately, to just get them through. But now there's this opportunity that everybody is just saying, Bring uniformity to all the rooms. Um, other areas we looked at again the resource room, special eds. 
Uh, again, different type trapezoidal table here, but again, the same cubby type system. Again, the mail slots was a very important item to the staff. And then these other items that we looked at here, some fun seating, storage for the staff, bookshelves. Uh, again, the student chairs, teacher chair, reading table. Uh, this, this goes actually in the music room here, but uh, same thing in music and the art, they have the same type of desk unit. So all the staff will have the same exact desk unit and chairs and storage for their for their things. This is the art and steam room. These tables change a little bit, obviously. There's epoxy tops on these. They're very, very pretty there for any type of art activity. Uh, anything gets spilled on them, uh, they're, they're very, very durable. And the art teacher really felt important to go to a stool in the art room as opposed to a conventional chair with a back on it. She felt very strongly there. So that's why that stool was a little bit different than what you saw in grades one through five. Uh, we have liter literacy lab and a book room, um, not as many items in the room, but uh, same similar components, uh, adding some uh, portable shelving in the book room as well, so again, so we can rearrange, uh, rearrange that room. The media center, a uh, big change in there from the bid pack three, we're taking out the old office that's in the center of the media center to gain more floor area. So the circulation desk is moving from its location to the side wall. So this is the new uh, circulation desk arrangement and then new tables and chairs. The chairs match the classrooms uh, and then new tables for uh, inside the uh, media center. Um, new shelving as well along the perimeter and then portable shelving on wheels. Uh, right now, if you remember Swanson, there's several rows that are very, very high. They're, they're six foot high. They come off of the wall, come out, and they, they are not movable. And it really restricts the usage of the room as far as the square footage. So they felt it very important to have uh, some movable shelving that they could rearrange and uh, not have, basically they're locked. Half of the, about half of that media center, maybe even more, is fixed because the way that the shelving is. So it leaves them with very, very little floor space to actually have story time or do a project. So this really opens up the entire media center to be totally flexible where they can rearrange that as they need to. Then we looked again, we mentioned at the, uh, the offices, the conference rooms, there's several, several work rooms around uh, that are being used for also student instruction for small groups of students go in. Um, but we also looked at the main area. So this is the conference room uh, up front. Right now, it's, it's, it's a clinic kind of room, but we're going to move the cot into a different location so Jessica can have a conference room up in her office area. Um, her space is staying the same with her furniture. It's relatively new, but we're going to do a new table and a chair so she can have a conference inside her actual room. Um, there's the special ed offices down on the, the east side of the... Uh, of the building there again it's it's a it's a mismatch of furniture over the years that people have brought in but they do meet with students on a regular basis so oops so now they would have their own uh they would have the same desk unit reading table student chairs and then a storage area for their files so all all five i think there's six rooms down there would all be the same as far as the components that are in each room staff lounge we get a facelift we are putting some new cabinetry along the wall here in bid pack three, and we're going to change the flooring and then give them some new tables that they can arrange. You see there's four of them there. They can push them together, make a large meeting space. Right now, they don't have the facility, the facilities to do that. And then some soft seating for them for relaxation. So the student, the staff lounge also gets a, gets a facelift. Um, the front reception coming in the main office, this would be a new reception a counter here. And then the two secretary stations would be new as well, so they would match the front counter. The counter that's there now um, is made out of wood. I don't know who made it years ago, but it's not working because it's all at a high level and they can't see the little kids when they come in. So this will be a, a two-height uh, two uh, reception area here. So when the kids come in, they can be better, better served. And then there's some storage needs again and uh, some other work areas and workrooms. I added this. This is the sheet from bid pack three which is all the built-in cabinetry that is going in uh, almost every room in the in the building uh, this is kind of you can't see it i apologize but this is kind of the main setup for the classrooms 
There's a 48 inch wide tall storage unit and then a teacher wardrobe unit with a counter, base cabinets, wall cabinets. Every room will have those components. They may be different because they're different sizes and shapes, but every, every room will have a wardrobe cabinet for the teacher and a, a storage cabinet and a countertop, which they, some of them don't have any countertop space right now. So they felt that was really important. But again, that's in bid factory. You've already bought that last time. Uh, so the furniture, again, we, we had the help of two different vendors as we, when we completed the survey, with the staff and we had all that out. Again, there's in the National Co uh, Cooperative, there's 55 different furniture manufacturers. So it took them a while to do that, but they helped us do that to get the most uh, economical cost for, for the district. So we are a little bit over budget because the original bond only had classroom furniture and deck. Everything you saw in here that we just went through, when we add all that up together, we're over budget by about 380 some thousand dollars in the main overall picture of the uh, of the furniture budget. So the good news is we had the savings of bid pack three of 800 and some. So our recommendation is to take the overage amount out of the bid savings from bid pack three. The other thing about the, the furniture is the movement of the old furniture and also the boxes when the teachers pack up. So they have to pack up everything in their room in boxes. They have another company that would come in move the boxes down to the gymnasium temporarily for the summer. So the contractors can do their work for the new flooring and finishes and so forth. Then the boxes have to move back into the room and the teachers would unpack. So as, along, as, along with that is all the furniture that would have to move out of the classrooms as well so they can tear up all the flooring and so forth. So I think that was 100 and 115. 115. So that would also come out of the bid savings of bid pack three um, and there's one more item that we thought about was in bid pack three, we're getting the new uh, entry features here over the East C entrance and the main office or the main uh, elementary entrance. But there's the old, there's the old dark brown and green painted plaster that's up high here and here. And it runs all the way down the base of the building. And there's some of the old metal teal colored doors there. We thought this would be a great opportunity to complete the facelift of Harvey Swanson and paint those areas. And Mark was able to get a local contractor who's done a lot of work in, in the district already, gave us a great price, probably one third of what we thought it was going to cost. So we'd like also to take that out of the bid savings as well from bid package three. So the entire front of the property would be done the entire interior party would be done and all the furniture as well when we open the doors in the fall. I think that's it. <laughs> um, okay, I, I think that we do have some questions. Um, so in the classrooms now does uh, one through five have those reading tables, or it, some do and some don't. Can you speak some, a little bit of what? Some do, some don't. They're not doing different sizes and shapes, but they each have a reading table and chairs in addition to their desks. And then um, for the filing cabinets, so that became something that we needed because the kids' desks. The the not the filing the cabinets. Cubbies, the, 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 the toe. The toe. Yes. Yeah. The movable one so that became something that they needed because their desks do not have storage correct that's right okay and then do they currently have um the mailboxes in no. every classroom no they don't that was something that they wanted to establish for every grade level they don't all have mailboxes right now okay so a lot of the ancillary items is what i'm hearing came in i mispronounced that oh, that's good. came in um because not every classroom has it. I guess I, we're, I just want to gain an understanding of how these extra items sure, came yeah. in. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the committee did a great job of brainstorming of what they have now versus what they would really like to have and you know, by grade level, obviously. And um, those other items that we talked about, the mailboxes, some of the, the, some of the other bookcases, the cubbies, uh, the totes, I'll call them, um, was just a result of their brainstorming and discussion as far as what would be the best way to set up the classroom. 
in addition to the permanent stuff that we had built in. We had those conversations at the same time we were talking about furniture because the built-in furniture then allowed us, we didn't have to buy so much bookcases and so forth because we're building some of that storage in place, permanent. So I appreciate your explanation. And what I perceive is that in some ways, the overage is due to the fact that some spaces in Harvey are actually used, they may not be classroom proper. You know, they, they're not classrooms treated day in, day out where the kids are, are in their class. However, there are other spaces where instructional time is spent. And so similar furniture is needed in those spaces as would be the case in, in the classroom proper. Trying to get back to the Does floor that make plan. sense? Yes, that's exactly. I'm trying to get back to the floor plan to show you. Right. I remember that's the image I have in my head is all of the various spots where um, teachers, staff are working with kids. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm down with it in my head. Can you yeah. take us back to that? Yeah. 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 The, uh, the no, east right. end of the, of the building. Yes. There we go. So yes. that one? Uh, keep going, please. It's the, it's the floor plan. It's actually way at the beginning. Yeah, it's like the first. Oh, my pointer still works. Right there. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so there's rooms right here. Yeah, I know those. And then there's another room down here. So those rooms are actually student spaces where they meet with staff mm -hmm. uh, daily. So what it's it's a uh, it's very underutilized right now as far as storage. So that's in in the bit pack three. We built in 24 inch deep all storage cabinets along the entire wall to help us with the storage part. Sure. But the furniture is where we, we added a reading table and six chairs and then a teacher chair in those types of spaces there because currently they're used for instruction and meetings every day. So arguably, the many of the pieces that are being tossed into an ancillary basket are, are actually could be moved to the, the necessary basket because what they're doing is further assisting rooms that maybe were serving as instructional space, but really stretching it yeah, and no. uncomfortably. And I, I know because anyway, yes. Um, so with that, some of the, the overage is due to initially looking at a scope that intending to cover proper updated furniture without teachers buying their own, bringing in to make do to um, furnish classrooms, but then on a broader scope, increase our instructional areas and outfit them properly to be comfortable for everyone and make sure that we are using the building in its entirety for as, as much instruction as possible. Is that fair? I would agree with that. I, the, the original bond budget for furniture was really insufficient for the needs of what this building has. In part because one, Harvey is how old and when did it last receive? Some of these are rhetorical. Yeah. It's how old and how many, you know, Mark knows how old. When, <laughs> when, you know, when's the last time that furniture just wasn't purchased because a teacher's, you know, um, chair broke and it was replaced with another broken chair, just not as broken. And, um, you know, on down the line is one example. So, and then everything is old. Where Oakwood, thankfully, very, very thankfully, Oakwood has, even though it's, it's getting older, everything was purchased as part of building that, that facility. So now we're trying to get more instructional space available to our teachers and kids out in and outside of the classroom, more flexible space by having more flexible furniture. There were also improved, improving instructional services and access. and. The, so all of that, I see it, I, I hear it, I see it, I understand it, and it makes sense to me. And if it's hitting the kids and improving the kids' situations and um, learning um, opportunities and more helpful to the staff in every way, making their jobs easier, that in the context of just the general age, again, of everything Harvey Swanson and trying to make that uh, a learning place that's more up-to-date, I get all of that. The concern that I have 
is is simply is this and it's a question that I I have to ask because of my job sitting here is is this leaving us um, you know whenever anybody hears the word overage I think they often unnecessarily look at at it as um, a moment to be concerned and and freak out I see it as an opportunity to ask questions. So the question I have to ask is, does that leave us in a, a bad position, a uh, squinchy position for any other um, overages we might see in other areas? Or is that irrelevant because this the extra money we have in Bit Package 3 can only be used for this purpose anyway? So there's no cross-pollinating of money. So the answer is no. Does that make sense? It's okay. <laughs> That's, it's a great question. And to answer your question, yes, we're not in a bad situation because on bid package three, we have some allowances built into the bidding. And then there's also the contingency set aside that the Department of Treasury requires us right. to, to maintain. So we're not dipping into those at all. Uh, this is the, the bid savings that we have from the original bid is what really I want to take advantage of here and, and utilize some of the bid savings. So it doesn't hurt us for the rest of RB Swanson moving into summer construction. We're not, we don't have to take a step back or reorganize or you think what we're doing in bid package three, it really has no impact on it. Okay. So I'm sure the other board members have, a, have great questions as well. Where I stand right now is that I understand the um, the basis for the the increased scope, I guess I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, the benefit of the increased scope and how it changed the the journey it traveled from the beginning to you know where we are i i get it and as long as the purpose is again toward improving the learning environment in a reasonably necessary way you know the the staff i'm sure on the survey was not asked you know what grade of leather do you want on your on your chair you know it we're talking Net reasonably necessary is the best phrase I can come up with. And um, taking part, I know it was more difficult, but taking part of the, um, I'm not going to use the right word, the coalition, the furniture cooperative, cooperative that's what I needed. Um, cooperative, I'm sure that gained a lot uh, dollar wise for the increased scope. I would imagine, given how those usually work, that if we decrease the scope, the prices for what we are buying actually might go up. And I know that, you know, Buy one, get one free is never a reason to buy something. But if there's any element to that, then there's something to be said for that as well. Um, if there was an area of compromise, I am trusting that it's already been investigated, that there is a way of, um, of decreasing this in a reasonable way. I'm sure it's already been investigated. And so I'm trusting in that, that that's the case. Um, and as long as I'm, I'm not hearing that this puts us in a, a position that jeopardizes any other projects, and I don't mean to be the dark cloud and ask that, you know, but as long as it, it doesn't jeopardize any other projects and, and is reasonably necessary, this new scope is reasonably necessary and it hits the children, it hits the staff. I look forward to hearing what the other board members have to say. <laughs> well, I think that you covered a lot of what we were thinking. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just, yes, of course, you hear the word overage and you have concerns. So um, I agree with Lisa that I want to make sure that we're not, um, you know, causing another project to have to be reduced or to not happen. I think the biggest concern, I think that. I'm pretty sure that we all have is the parking lot at Harvey and wanting to address that appropriately and um, just making sure that any money that was left over from bid pack three that that I mean I know that is the main focus is we really feel strongly about getting that you know taken care of and resurfacing is not going to cut it we have to redirect for the safety of everyone um, so I think that that is probably one of our biggest concerns and making sure that, you know, that we don't look back and say that would have helped cover what we need here. 
Yeah, we the balance of the bid savings would be diverted to the parking lot because there's really nothing else to do with Swanson inside and outside after the discussion today. Um, so the balance is almost 300,000 or so would still go to the party parking lot discussion that I brought some slides to to talk about that as well tonight. Well, I'm curious, um, <clears throat> and I appreciate Lisa's explanation and um, comments. Um, I'm curious why the scope was it considered in the first place? I guess, you know, we expanded this scope now, but why wasn't it, wasn't that the original scope in the first place? My question. Great question. I'm not sure I can 100% answer that other than um, we added some money for furniture, like only for the classrooms at the time, several years ago. Um, there wasn't a full blown investigation or committee that was formed prior to the bond going out to identify all these areas that we just talked about. So I don't know if I can 100% answer why that was only 530,000. Um, that's the allocation that was in the bond when it went to the, the voters. I think mine was the same thing with the old bridge where I thought about it and why it wasn't part of the original scope. But then I also like the fact that it's getting a whole new face that everything's going to be new and out with the old, in with the new, give it a whole new, fresh look, complete, make it complete, and then move on with the money as long as it doesn't affect money moving to somewhere else. And I think I can get behind it. I think one of the things that I was thinking about is just when you have, you know, three or four classrooms that are teaching the same grade level, like third or fourth or fifth, that they each have the same setup in their room and are able to do similar things. I feel like we're really trying to, as a district, just all be on the same page with, um, you know, what the opportunity that each grade and school has that they're similar and we're able to move up with those. So I can understand when, you know, we don't necessarily have those in all the classrooms that that being important for them to have consistently across the grade levels. Anything else? So you're going to talk again or? <laughs> yeah, cool. um, yeah, so again, the, the uh, using the overage, uh, using the surplus of funds from the bid savings to cover the overage we talked about, we proceed. One, I have one question. I just, I feel like our high school are waited. Um, oh, do do that? What if we just, just before we get into the next thing, because <laughs> she might not want to be here for all this, <laughs> but I appreciate that. I'll shut up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank all you. right, student report. Thank you. Um, I don't, Maria, would that work right now? Yes. I come over here. Two and S You know the rest, right? So maybe kind of slow, so you may just want to talk about it because um, it has not come through. So you may just want to talk about talk from your okay. phone there. It has not come through yet. Hon. Um, I'm Regan Steffi, and I am the Secretary of Student Council. Um, so just some like you know 
the whole around school things, student council things. Um, there's five Wednesdays left for the seniors. There's nine Thursdays left for the juniors or and freshmen and sophomore, whatever. Um, spring sports, I don't have a lot. I just got some from people in student council. Girls lacrosse have one win and one loss. Girls soccer have three wins and one loss. Boys baseball have one win and two losses. Um, the student council officers are having their last FML meeting of the school year in Flushing on April 21st. And Star Wars is gonna be held on May 5th for the juniors and seniors to watch. If you don't know what Star Wars it is, it's just like, um, basically all the seniors get to vote on nominees for uh, like mock elections basically. And the winners will get to come up on stage and get them like a gift bag, usually has like a t-shirt inside or something, so. That's about it. Though. So, um, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Brian, you want to come back? <laughs> 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 What's other stuff that um, we'll meet to later? Or... I mean, I think we're okay. Yeah, I think you know, it's fine. Sorry. Don't worry, you bring up the. <laughs> what am I bringing up now? My, but the earlier presentation that I was. Oh, the one we were just yeah. doing. Yep. Okay. okay, so um, so we'll use the old bridge. Sorry, oh, the first. We'll use the uh, surplus to cover the furniture, and then we'll, we'll execute the purchase orders for the direct purchase of the furniture. I'll do that with Jan at her office. Um, so we do have. Again, we have 115,000 for the moving costs, another 20,000 or so for the painting that would also come out of the surplus. It leaves us with almost $300,000 then to transfer into the parking lot uh, line item. So if you remember from our discussions from several times ago, the, um, the original bond allocation for the parking lot was this scheme in, in purple here. These were prepared by the civil engineer uh, so the 650000 in the bond allocation was to replace the pavement that you see in purple uh, one for one. No expansion. Um, when we got into this and started talking about doing the beginning of the design, then many things popped up as issues at this parking lot. Uh, bus traffic merges with the parents and the kids walking through. Uh, the buses to get to the parents and the cars that parents that want to park and walk through versus parents that drop off and kids are crossing through. Um, and the early childhood is down here. They have to go into this entrance down here. And then there's also doors here. So you have parking parents for early childhood, you have elementary parents here. And again, the, uh, the buses come in and line up here. And it's just, there's a whole bunch of safety uh, safety concerns, as well as the, uh, I think Jessica's concern that she's expressed before is, is the actual parking spaces that is a, are, are available to park in here. Um, so last year, she did a great job coming up with the uh, traffic safety folks of having the parents come here and then they curl around. Um, I think you've got to train that pretty well to do, but it doesn't alleviate a lot of the problems that we had. So we, we took a, a look at it and came up with an idea of uh, separating the buses. We make it like a bus cul-de-sac here. So they would come down the side road. Mark, I forgot, what's the name of that road over there? Edwards. Thank you. So we come down there and the buses would circle. Now we have total separation of bus versus car. And we would make a connection right here through the green belt area where the cars would still come in and then cross over and use the current bus drop off lane. And that's where the kids would actually get out of the vehicle as they pull up along the sidewalk here. Uh, and then the parents would then exit out. Um, you can see probably very tough. There's a, there's a, a green line here and here. And we, what we want to do is actually make a, put a decorative fence up at these spots and this spot 
and have a dedicated crosswalk where there's only one spot where the kids and parents could cross, which gives the staff much more ability to supervise and stop the car traffic, let people cross, and then car traffic again. Likewise, for early childhood, it would be one crosswalk here, right in line with their entrance as well. So putting up some decorative fencing here would stop the you know, people or kids running to mom and dad, um, which should improve the safety aspect for sure. Uh, also adding a sidewalk along here as well and adding uh, some more concrete, some more paved surface here for when the kids are waiting. Uh, right now, there's a, basically a big mud hole out here when the kids are waiting for mom and dad and it's, it's a mess. So we're adding some more concrete here for a staging area, but this will totally separate the car traffic from the bus traffic um, what this plan didn't do uh, was increase the parking spaces. So we, we did another version of this where we would add some asphalt to go down here, widen the parking lot a little bit so then we can restripe it as you see here more efficiently. We'd go from about 221 spaces to 288 spaces. So we would pick up more spaces by adding the strip of asphalt here. Um, the cost of this, this is this cost about a year old from the civil engineer was $1.65 million, $1,650,000 to do this scheme as opposed to the original guy was this for just $650,000. So it adds a million dollars to the project to add in the safety features and then increase your uh, ability to park cars. So that's kind of a, we feel, the best compromise. We also went fully new redesign, but we just can't even afford that. So we felt this was the best compromise to pick up some safety features, separate buses from cars, add parking spaces for Jessica and the staff for their events and so forth. Uh, and also, like I said, improve the big thing is improve the safety. So you just have two crosswalks here that staff can manage much more efficiently but we have a million dollars to buy. Minus the 300. <laughs> Minus the 300. So we have $700,000 to find to make this work. So we're still short in our goal of getting the budget money put aside to do this scheme. Um, I have a, a couple questions just about the design. Um, in this question, I'm sure there's a reason so why are we not utilizing i it says that there's a gate there now a swing barrier gate why are we not using that as an entrance like we used to and then the exit that we use now why do we why are we still going in one spot i think this can like help with the number of cars yeah it was just the congestion of the amount of cars when cars were coming in edward street and using that it was causing such a backup that the buses couldn't get in okay um so we closed that one to try to bring people in the one just to get as many cars in the parking lot as possible and off the roads um because it was just causing this jam and then mm -hmm. nobody took those because then people couldn't get out and traffic was at a standstill so that's when we were having problems at the beginning of the year with traffic going out to m15 and out to Granger. So with the one entrance and getting as many cars in the parking lot as we could alleviate that traffic jam outside of the parking lot. And so you think even with the buses coming in and having their own little circle, we would still need to have that blocked off? I think, I mean, I think it's a good option to have the gate there. Um, I I think it all depends. It's really Edward Street right there and how efficiently quickly we can get the buses in and out. Okay. Um, with using it, both entrances and cars coming from both ways because that's really what that second the closed entrance was was people coming in off of edward and going in that way um it was causing a backup so the bus is going to get in or if we just had like an entrance you know where the closed gate is and then that being an exit like they're one way only just I, a thought i just i mean that's an option i think we'd have to look at how many cars we can how many cars is that leave on the road it's okay good and then my other question, Brian, is I see in this drawing with our extra parking spots, it goes over into the tennis court. So what does this, what cost do we incur once we cross over to these tennis courts? And because we can't just like cut an edge off and it'd be fine. Well, I guess the question would be, do the tennis courts have a light? Because right now they're not used and they have to be, if they're going to be used as tennis courts, 
going to be totally redone. Um, so I guess the question is, do we do we retain these guys and and go back to this scheme, which we don't touch the tennis courts, but then we don't pick up parking spaces. So if we were, I'm just throwing this out there. If we were to not not do anything with the tennis courts right now, like just, I mean, not redo them. That's definitely not something that we're thinking about right now. At least the school incurring that cost. Um, what would be the solution once you cut into that? Like, what could we, would you have to, would it just be, if we cut into it, then we have to tear it all out or what happens once we're well, we crossing would, over into it? You, you would lose one court. Okay. So it would still give you seven, but um, I guess it's it's a decision for the How? board if you want to leave them alone or if you can sacrifice one court to gain the spaces for the parking. How many, so, if we just left the tennis courts um, and took that corner, how many parking spots approximately is that? 16. No, uh, just that little section we, right we now. Basically cut the, we cut the extra in half. So we go probably the 250-ish instead of 280-ish okay. because we'd have to jog the traffic pattern around the corner of the tennis court. So we'd still gain parking, but not as much as if we can go all the way straight across. So I, I mean, I don't necessarily, I'm not seeing a problem losing a court. I guess I'm just wondering what the cost is because we're not just gonna, what do we do with that space? Are we, then is it cement? Are we putting grass in? There has to be a cost to taking that out and replacing it with something. Well, literally we would just yes. re redo the fencing right here across the corner and leave the court as is. Okay. We really wouldn't do anything. No, right, I'm saying that one court though. Like if we're cutting into one court, well, he's saying no, no, that it would just be that edge of the court. And that's yeah, why we just just clip off the edge of the court here, redo the fencing around it. So you if you decide in the future to go back and redo it, you still have seven full size tennis courts. Okay. What is the cost difference between the, the this, slide this one and, one? and about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars according to the civil engineer estimate? So this is about 1.5 to do this with all the with all the improvements up in this area, and then to add the slice down here is about another hundred fifty thousand dollars. Is it every day that we have a, a parking issue? Not not just events. We have um, we have really increased our preschool enrollment. Those parents have to park and get out and right now that's becoming a big problem we have a lot of preschool parents saying i get there and there's nowhere to park um so now they're starting to park on the edges because there's no parking spots now we are eating up some parking spaces with the way that we're bringing people in right now um over some parking spots but it, it is a daily issue and with the closure of butcher we added a gray which added a need for more parking. I, I know I'm going back in time, but on the overall enrollment, K five, JK five is over 500 students at Harvey. Right. That does not include um, our preschool uh, students as well. So we have a lot of students right. over there now that we have had recently, and more staff <clears throat> from the yeah. Isn't there some agreement with the township and the district, the tennis courts? And I'm not sure. I think I kind of heard some rumblings, and is there some effect? Not anymore. Not anymore. There used no. to be. And we then own you just them cut now. the track off. What's it going to look like? We're going to this extent to fix it, beautify, it, and then we're just going to flip the corner. And like, what's it going to look like? Fixing the tennis. I mean, if you're just flipping that corner, going with this concept, and you're going to flip the corner of that yeah. one tennis board, and you're going to leave it, just cut it, put the parking. And what's that? Going through all this work that beautify the parking lot and then you're just leaving you're cutting into the tennis court what's that look like I mean, yeah, it's just going to be kind of half done where it's in this scheme we're not spending one dollar on the tennis courts mm -hmm. because it's a disaster it's uh to rebuild them as they are um it's like eighty thousand dollars a court according to what the uh, expert they told me um to make that into parking we looked at that possibly currently with the parking lot area 
that jumped us up to about two million dollars. Uh, just to go back in because it's not salvageable, we have to take it out anyway, redo the base, redo the topping. So that's an expensive little guy right there. Little tennis court. I mean, what would it be if you take out that one tennis court completely and add a little green space so it doesn't look chopped? Oh, up? I got you. Yeah, like maybe yeah, maybe bring the fence back like this and yeah, get rid of that one all together, and then now you got like that. Yeah, seven. We definitely could do that, not so it doesn't look like we just got piecemeal together. Uh, yeah, we we could bring that fence back like this, like an L shape here, and restore that back as grass area. Absolutely, and that's not going to be a budget breaker. Yeah. That would look much better if you can live with a future of possibly seven courts instead of eight. Well, I, I guess I need to ask when we, we were talking about the need for the tennis courts and you know having seven versus eight. My my first question is if they've been there basically dormant and at the risk of suggesting nobody uses them. I want to respect. Mm -hmm. Any of our you know community members who who do tend to use them, but I see more people using the high school tennis courts, right, um, in the evenings in the summer and such. But so if someone does use them, apologies out there. But um, you know, going from eight to seven, what are we missing? I mean, what what would we be? What was what is our loss there? The benefit of the parking lot is greater than the loss of the one. There's no loss right. as far as I see. Um, it's just the loss of something that continues to deteriorate due to lack of use and update. So I guess I don't see that as a uh, a real consideration, you know, to for me and the way my mind's working um, to give that much weight because we'll have seven others that we need to consider what to do with at right. some point. Um, so I'm not as concerned about that. The burning question I have is, this is lovely. I wish we could even find more parking spaces, but if, the, if we can gain 60-ish, fantastic. How do we think? So a couple ideas. Um, so getting back to this is the high school campus, we talked about this guy before. It's the big student parking lot here. Um, this fellow here, Goodman Drive, was never in the original bond. We had 1.6 million put aside for the entire high school campus to address parking needs. This is actually Mark and I again looking at it. This is actually the worst case, worst condition of anything on the site. Um, Back about a year ago, the engineer estimated this about $330,000 to redo that roadway. It's been so much traffic, and it's really not in good shape. So out of all these areas here, uh, Mark and I feel that this is priority number one. And there was never any money in the for this guy. Um, when we did bid package number one, we had, a, 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 I'll use that dirty word again, the overage for bid package one. And we took some money out of the parking lot fund to balance the budget on bid pack one. It left about a million dollars in parking lot to decide what to, what to do with the parking. Um, we need this guy, he's important. And then my, my recommendation is to take the 330 out of the million dollars for the parking lot that we have set aside, take the remaining 700 that we need to move that to Swanson. So in summer 24, we would do the Swanson parking lot and Goodman Drive. It depletes our high school parking lot fund down to zero, but it's kind of a temporary depletion because at the end of this summer, bid packs one, two, and three are wrapping up in September. There's about $700,000 in contingency money that's set aside by law that we're keeping just in a separate basket. If we don't have to dip into that money, then in September, it's going to free that money up. So I'll be coming back to you in September saying, we have unused contingency that can be directed to another project. Where would you like to do it? And you could replenish the high school fund at that time, and then talk more seriously in the fall about, okay, 
we want to attack which area do we want to attack for the high school of doing the parking lot. So that's one thought that I had to do of getting the two worst areas done, which is Goodman Drive and Swanson, getting it designed so we can bid it in September for summer 24. But this September, we're going to know where we stand with the contingency of bid packs one, two, and three, because they're going to wrap up in September. And then come back to you and say, okay, where do you want to divert this money to? Okay, so confuse you. What what happens if the Harvey Park plant for 1.6 ends up more than what we anticipated? Where does that overage then come from? If we have both of these projects rolling out, um, let's say it's it's 400 over. We now need 2 million. Where are we going to get make up that money? Well, one option would be the unused contingency for bid back one, two, and three. Or if there's some other little, little channel, I think we're going to have earned interest income by then. Bond. Yeah, we, our earned interest income is higher than was originally anticipated when we did the bond application. So there's some there. There could be some money there. And so if we choose to do Goodman Drive, and that was not in the original. How does that play out for us with the bond if we're not touching things that were in the original with the uh, high school? Or well, is it because it's on the high school property? The ballot language is, is pretty vague. It allows you to have district improvements or parking lot improvements and such. So you could shift funds to do certain areas of the parking lot as you deem necessary. You can do that with Treasury. Yeah, you definitely can do that. But the one project that's probably getting left out is the it's the high school soccer field because we already used that money for the high school turf. So there eventually are going to be projects that can't be funded. So when you're talking about the money left over at the high school, are you talking about part of that money being the high school or the soccer field? Um, it, it could go to the soccer field or it could go to back to the parking lot. The One parking lot do, does have needs. There's not enough money for both. That's, why, for that's both. why I wanted to make sure the board understood. There's not another pocket of money for both. The other thing is, again, that normally with the bond issues, as the projects go out and they get built, again, the, the contingency, you never want to use it. You'll use it if you have to. So as the projects get built and you go farther down your bond list, Hopefully that contingency fund grows and then towards the end of the bond, then you can circle back and maybe that's when the soccer field gets done and you have more unused contingency, but we just won't know that number for another year. Can I piggyback off Rebecca on the funding? So the bond application we did on one, it's been a couple of years. Carl was here. 21, early 22. So the numbers that we have in the bond application. By the time this goes out to bed, are going to be over two years old. That's correct. So, knowing what happened with the high school football stadium turf, which went way up like double, I think we just have to consider that those numbers probably will be higher, much higher. Very positive. Yeah, I, I just wanted to put that out there too, because we saw that with the turf. For sure. Well, just to piggyback on that, so when you first showed the parking lot revision at 1.6 million, I think, 1.65. So that's what back stress five. Yeah, six five, right. So but did you say that was a year old bid? Um, that that number on there is about a year old a from, year. The, from the civil engineer. So that that actually makes me a little nervous because we do know prices have gone up in a year considerably. It'll be two years because by the time the project gets done. Right, right. Well, we, what we want to do is bid it out in September, time frame October. So get those numbers in before the holiday and see what they are. So about a year and a half. Try to be the first ones out of the gate this time rather than last time. Remember, we were kind of pushing it. So we, the schedule is is to get get decisions and let the engineers design, get it to the construction manager in September. So we can get one of the first ones out of the gate for the summer of 24 and hopefully get the best numbers. <clears throat> I guess the off the series two, we have a million two in technology, and I hate to start talking about series two, but um, 
there's a possibility that we may not need to replace our <clears throat> replace our current classic technology. You know, we're, that's going to be new. You know, it seems, you know, but 10 years from now, the military is going to go way down in the community and there's probably a good chance that the community would pass another bond issue, but that debt levy is going to be seven or eight. It's going to be way lower than it is now. So it, perhaps the classroom refresh would happen at that time. I know Thomas is here tonight. And I just talked about it. I don't see where we would need to spend a million two in five years or so. But I'm just, I know I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, right. but mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to look at the whole picture because I know it's in series two as well. I guess some of my concern, we did promise stuff for the soccer field improvements down there. And if they said there's no money putting in the park line, we do nothing, not going to look so good. Well, that's where maybe the technology so, money could come in. So <laughs> just to kind of go back to where we are tonight, tonight we need to make a decision on the Oak Ridge at Harvey. Um, we're going to have another meeting where we discuss this before our, our next committee, the whole meeting, we'll discuss this more. I don't wanna get into like details of the other bid packs right now, just because that's not on our, our plate tonight. Um, but, um, you know, it's important to obviously take in a little bit more information to understand where we are financially, um, if there's possible overages. So. What I could do in the meantime, just to get as much information as possible, is I, I go back to the civil engineer and have a look at these schemes again and see what recent numbers that have come in, what he feels, if we're still okay, or if he thinks, Brian, this is no good. But um, if you would allow me to do that exercise so I can get you more updated information, I would like to do that. Do you think that you could have that done before our next, the committee of the whole meeting that Absolutely. we have? That, I think that would be very helpful. Okay, extremely yes. helpful. I think that would help with guide your, Absolutely. your decision. For sure. Now, yeah. Is it? Is his word gold? No, but at least we can see how things have gone maybe in a year later since he put that number on it. Because, um, you know, they do bidding all the time. And so right. they'll, they'll have a good idea of what's currently going on. And again, the question I have for him is forecast this out to September 23. Right. What you feel. And, and Goodman Drive. If you and Goodman Drive. That and exactly there. right. Yeah. Yeah. I can do that. If you allow me to do that exercise, I can get you more information on that. Yes, please. Can you add, like, if that one quart on the end comes out, what the what would that add to the parking lot? Yeah. Like, sure. I know there's going to be that expense to that. Yeah. I'll, I'll add that, Jeff, to the yeah. sketch. And just one quick question, but, um, and I noticed there's two walkways, one for preschool and one for elementary that cross or entrance into the building, right? The two walkways from the parking lot. Right. right, yep. So just to clarify, at, at the time that the application went in and these numbers were first visited, it was probably closer to two years ago. Oh, and yeah, I just, I, I, I love when you did that, the treasury, yeah, yeah, for the treasury application. Sure. So I just, I mentioned that to the extended and forms the, the conversation with the civil engineer mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm sure updated is updated, probably doesn't matter that it's one and a half versus two years. But to the extent it does matter, we just wanted to highlight that fact that it probably is closer to two years as Absolutely. to the, the measure of the numbers. You're 100% right. So yeah. I, I don't know. You may don't care. I'm mean, looking at today. Don't care. It went to Treasury in June of um, 2021. That's, That's when we took it to Treasury. Treasury. So those numbers were done before that. Yeah. We were just starting to get punched in the face with COVID at that mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm going to ask him to. Forecast this guy out to October, November right. 23, and give me his best guess of what that would be so that I can come back to you with better information. May I have one question regarding the fencing? I like that idea, but what does that look like? Is it more of a security barrier for you know, no, safety it's, action no, issues? No, it's not going to be an MDOT type thing. It could be more of a you know four foot aluminum decorative type fencing that looks more attractive. Um, just to signify they can't walk there. No, I get it. I just don't want like a pit barrier. It won't be designed to stop a vehicle or anything like that where you got the big colors and the big piece of the metal. It'd be, be nice and decorative and pretty and you know, but the aluminum looks like wrought iron kind of a deal. I'm just thinking of the height and making sure that you know you can't get a leg over it. I will have it. The kids will be not 
I'm worried about the kids at home. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. All right. So I owe you more information for for this guy. Okay. But again, I, I, to just recap, uh, we'd like to give a Jan's office tomorrow and we'll go ahead and get those purchase orders done for the furniture to get us ready for the vendors say that we're still okay for getting stuff here in August. So we put that purchase order in. So I'd like to get permission to do that. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Thank I, you. That's all I have. For Okay, next on the agenda, superintendent reports. Um, I have one this evening, and I'm going to read it if you don't mind to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, but I would like to celebrate our high school robotics team, the Trucktown Thunder. We're heading to world competition. It's our first time in five years um, heading down to world. So um, our team is heading to world. Like I said, every January, a new game is released for all robotics teams across the state of Michigan. And teams have to build a competitively new robot able to play a specific game. After a long winter, the BHS team competed at two district competitions in March. This year, the team won their first competition and then placed in fourth out of 40 teams at their second competition. Because of their success, they qualified for the Michigan State Championship, and um, they competed with teams from all over the state. At the end of that competition, they qualified for the World Championship, which is in Houston, Texas, and it's happening this weekend. They will be competing against teams from all over the globe. Um, our robot will start its journey down to Houston tomorrow in its trailer, and our students will be flying down on Wednesday morning. We have 16 students traveling um, along with our mentors. Um, very excited about that. Um, so they arrive Wednesday morning. Practice competitions begin on Wednesday afternoon, so they'll be right at it. And the competition uh, completes on Saturday evening, and our students will be flying home on Sunday. So we wish them the best of luck. We will be tracking them later this week. I'm very proud of all of them and um, just so excited for the memories they're all about to make that I'm sure will last a lifetime. So thank That's you. Awesome. The next item uh, this evening is our Brandon High School Showcase. If I can please pass the baton to Principal Dan Stevens and um, his guests here this evening for their presentations. Well, thank you, everybody, for having us. I want to apologize for Megan. She unexpectedly had to leave. So Jenny Eastman and I are uh, going to spend a little bit of time presenting it to you on something we're really excited about at the high school. And the best news is it doesn't cost a single cent of our bond dollars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, you are the next slide, Do I have a Anyway. So but a few weeks ago, I had a student come into my office and he was he was he was actually sent down the office. He was sent down to the office for bad mouthing the teachers, um, throwing a pencil uh, uh, across the room. It's a kid that I, I, I've experienced had experience with a few different times lately um, and, and over the last couple of years. And I knew that he was coming down to my office. I said, what am I going to do with this kid? Um, he's been down in my office before, haven't really seemed to have any success with him when it comes to his, when it comes to discipline. And so I, I'm very frustrated, waiting for him to come down to the office. And then I see, as I'm waiting for him in my office, I see Mrs. Hagerman. And you guys, all, a lot of you know Ellen Hagerman, our social worker. And I, I go, and I know she works with him. So I went out and talked to her, said, hey, I, I need some help with this, but he's coming down and, and all those kinds of things. I just don't know what to do with them. You know, traditionally, I've been, in I've been in education for 26 years. I've been an administrator for 15. And that old fashioned way of doing things is, all right, you're down. Go call your mom. We're going to get you out of here. You're going home. Um, we need to discipline this kid. Um, and so those are the things that we, we used to do in education, the things we still do need to do because discipline still plays a, a vital role in what we do. But there are other ways, and that's the kind of the ways that I want to talk about, something that we're excited about that we're doing at the high school. We've done it for years, but we, we're, we're really digging in this year. And so we've got this code here, alternative to traditional disciplinary measures focused on punishment. The focus here is on resolving conflict, repairing harm, and healing relationships. Because the fact of the matter is that this kid, I could send him home. I could suspend him for two days. I could have talked to his parents. I could have done a lot of different things with this kid. But at the end of the day, and we all, and many of us sitting here have kids. What does that really do? Yeah, it disciplines the behavior, but what about the next time? And the time after that? And the time after that? So what we decided to do with this kid 
as he came into my office, and I have a decent relationship with him, even, even though we've, we've, I've had to discipline him over the, over the last couple of years. He came into my office. Mrs. Hagerman came into my office, and we talked. We, we just talked. And when we talked, we found out all kinds of things that were going on with him. We found out some of the things that were going on with him, him at home. We found out some of the things that were going on with him with other students in the building. We found out with some difficulties, communication maybe issues that were going on with different teachers. And when we found that out and we really dug in and listened to this kid and talked to this kid, we found out that there was a lot more going on. We can't expect kids to come to Brandon High School and learn if they have all this other stuff that they're bringing with them every single day. So really what we're really, really focusing on this year, and like I said, it's not something new, but it's something we're really going to dig in that goes along with our ESL, our emotional and social learning. It goes along with our MTSS process, our multi, multi-tiered systems of support. It goes on to all those things, and that is this whole idea of restorative practices or restorative justices. And what, and I don't want people to get confused because this is not in place of discipline. Discipline still plays a role in our schools. We still need to use discipline, but we also need to go a step further in what we're doing with kids and find out who they really are so that we can, so we can meet them where they're at and then take them to the next level. So I'm going to apologize. This was Megan's part. I mean, Jenny, you're going to dig in here as, as, as best as we can. So, so why do we use these types of, why, why do we want to get to know this kid? Why do we want to use other measures? Why do we want to use other things when it comes to kids instead of just disciplining them? We have to have a lot of, we have to have, to have a lot of considerations. And when we do that, the research will show, and our own research that we're really developing a lot of this year, and then we'll have some good research at the end of the year, is that when we do those things, instead of just suspending kids, we're going to have a dis- decrease in suspensions. We're going to have an improved school culture, both with our staff and with our kids. It's going to bring kids together. That teacher, Mrs. Hagerman, myself, Mrs. Kozlowski, we all met as a group. We all talked things out. I'll tell you what, that kid right now, if you were to ask the teacher, that kid right now, um, the, the past three weeks since that issue's happened, hasn't really had it, hasn't had too much of an issue at all. Truth be told, I was the teacher. And it truly has made a difference. If we would have just suspended that kid, sent him on his way and yelled and screamed at him, he probably would have just come back the next day frustrated and mad and did the, whole, the same thing all over again. Um, so th- this is this this is going to be this is big for our kids. We're finding, um, and we're going to we, we have some, we're going to have some data to explore it even more. Um, so we want to. The ultimate goal is not to discipline a kid, but we want to change habits over time. We want to change how our kids think and what they do, and change their habits so that they can come and be productive students and productive citizens as well. Jenny, dive in here if you want to. This was this was kind of like I just summed this up kind of right, right here. Um, the things that we want to do is we want to address the needs of our school and community, build healthy relationships, resolve conflict, and repair repair harm um, to to everybody. And we hear both we heard the we hear the word bullying a lot, and and not just not just at Brandon, but you hear it all over. And and these are the types of things that we want to get to the root of. Does it take more time for us as administrators? Does it take more time for our counselors? Does it take more time for our social workers to really dig in? Heck yeah, it does. But what we're finding is it's worth it. And we're and, and it's going to do those little things. It's going to help our kids learn. It's going to help our kids prosper. It's going to help our test scores go up because they're going to be here. They're going to care. And one of the things that Jenny and I were, were talking about, what we really need to do is we really need to find those things that kids really love and really focus on those things. One thing that was brought up is the changing habits. So I think that's a huge thing that's come out of restorative practices since Ellen and I really initiated it last year within the classrooms. And uh, we started doing restorative circles, but then it started out with just my directed studies classes because there were so many social emotional needs that were in the room. And then we uh, took our show on the road this year, which was really exciting. We actually had a general ed teacher reach out to us and she was struggling with the makeup of her class and discipline issues within her classroom. So um, we got to sit down with the class. We did it once a week during my lunch, we would go in there and we would just meet with the kids and they came up with their own class norms. They came up with um, things that were bothering them about 
just, I mean, it ended up, we started talking about hats for probably two of the sessions about how they wanted to wear hats and they were very passionate about it, but they found all this common ground that they realized that they had a lot in common. So these groups of kids that really didn't start out getting along very well, by the end, um, they've been doing great things. So, and I know for sure, unfortunately, we, we don't have a ton of data yet because there's so much of it that we need to sift through it and everything. But I do know for sure, at least three of the children in there, their discipline has, referrals have gone down drastically since we've been in there from that teacher. So it's been huge. Um, so we've also been, um, yeah, I think that's it, right? <laughs> I think that's what I was going to talk about. <laughs> um, yeah, go to the next one. <laughs> so we've been, the, there's different organizations that we've been working with, BGYAs. One, um, we've been working closely with the truancy officer, and all that's kind of come about because of doing more restorative practices and trying to get to the bottom of why um kids are not coming to school or why they're not wanting to come or why they have so much anxiety that they can't you know so it's um bgya and the truancy officer isn't a bad thing it's just giving resources to families and we're communicating with families and um doing a really great job with that i know there's been a couple of my kids that have had just a minor suspension they, when they come back though they have come with the parent and we have a meeting and it's proactive and we really try to make sure that we're um, getting to know the families and the student. It used to be, and you, you don't mind I throw this no, in here, no. it used to be the truancy officer would come out to the school, parents would be involved in the meeting, the truancy officer would threaten the parents, say, you're going to go to jail, and I've, seen, I've actually seen parents handcuffed and going to jail before um, for truancy, um, and, and basically just threaten them. And didn't really even care about what was going on because that's their job. Their job is to come out here and make sure the kids are going to school. Our truancy officer that we have right now, she comes in here with a mindset of how can we make this better? What can we do to help you? What can we do to support you? What is going on that you're not making it to school? Which I think has made a real big difference as well. The other thing is our MTSS. So we, I team with Ellen on this, but we meet individually with kids that are struggling. Um, Dan does a great job highlighting who's, who's struggling with their grades. And also ultimately, most of the time, it's not because they can't do it. Most of the time, it's because there's a lot of stuff going on at home. And um, because we're, we're doing such a good job, like looking for those kids, um, we're able to give them the resources and get them into, you know, see the social worker, see their counselor when they wouldn't have maybe sought it out themselves. <clears throat> so... You go ahead sure. with this one. I think this was Megan and <laughs> oh, I know so, this is the okay. That I think I already talked about the classroom circles and um, we just we do those regularly on a regular basis. Yeah. So what we're what we're finding that there's there's district things that that we're doing. And then there's school things that we're doing, and then there's community things that we're doing. And at Brandon High School, one of, the, one of the coolest things that we're doing, and maybe Jenny can tell you a little bit more going in more depth, is when we see a classroom, there's, you know, every teacher has that one class every so often. It's that class that, oh my gosh, I just don't know what to do with this class. The, the mix is, is just wrong or whatever it is. And, and one of the things that we've started doing this year, we kind of just did it like, so let's try this kind of thing is these restorative circles where actually our social worker, um, Megan, our assistant principal, sometimes Jenny are actually going right into the classrooms and doing these restorative circles right in the class to try to find out what's going on. And we've seen in cases where kids have absolutely detested each other for whatever reason are now best friends. And I, we can say a couple different classrooms where that has taken place, just by going in and spending some class time talking to them and getting to, to know them as the young adults they are, um, and not just a student number. The beauty of elementary school is that you have them all day long, right? So you get to build that community um, like naturally, and it just kind of happens. But when you have them for one hour, and on top of it, it might be a subject that no one really is very that interested in, you know, and uh, then you put all that uh, stress of, they're just their lives. Um, sometimes that doesn't work out so well. And then to have time. So what we're grateful for is teachers that are really noticing that it's important to build community, even if you only have them for an hour a day and they're embracing the concept. So we've had three reach out to us so far. We're hoping that it just continues to grow. We're going to be starting PD on it um, more often. So 
um, we're hoping with all of that that so this is going with that circles that we kind of already talked about um, just just a few just a few minutes ago. And it, you, you get to hear different students, different perspectives, different ways of doing things. Um, and not only not only do our kids get to understand it, but then our teachers also get to understand our kids, and our kids get to understand our teachers, which is which is huge. One of the things that our kids will say, and, and, and it was just recent in the survey, in the surveys that we had last year, is that. Um, a, a high number of our kids feel like that they can go to a adult. Um, I don't know what that percentage was again, but but a high number of our kids feel like they can go to an adult and talk to them, uh, which is which is huge for uh, for uh, a school as big as a high school with seven hundred and thirty four kids. And so we don't really know the outcomes yet. <laughs> we got a whole bunch of data today. We thought we were going to come with like percentages and then we realized there's a lot to go through. So we have some work to do, but what we're going to be looking on um, is focusing on our behavioral, re behavior referrals. Um, we actually do think that maybe some of our referrals have gone up because of attendance. We've just been so hyper-focused on it and trying to get these families that might need our assistance um, assistance. So it, actually some of our reports might go up a little bit, but it's because we're being more proactive. Um, and then the communications between with families, we're just going to continue to do that because you just see the effects are very positive. So so what is our next what is our next steps? What do we need to do um, to, to advance this and make it bigger, better than it already is? So um, as Jenny just said, we are going to continue to make this a focus with professional development for their staff um, so that they can learn more and more about this um, conti and continue the things that we're already doing. Um, <clears throat> we want to make adjustments, use the data, the data that Jenny was talking about. Um, we asked Jenny, Jennifer Poston today for some data. Um, and like I said, I thought we were just going to have some percentages that we can show. Literally, I have, a, I have data for our seniors over the last four years. Every single senior, how many days they were absent, how many days they, well, how many targets they have, how many disciplinary referrals they have. I have that data for every kid, and and it just became overwhelming and just too much to sift through for this meeting here. But we are going to really dig into that stuff, and we're gonna we're gonna really dig in, and we're gonna use that data to improve what we're already doing. We have our SEL every Wednesday that we're currently doing right now. This can kind of focus those lessons. What with, with the data that we're finding, now we can focus our SEL lessons on those on those areas that matter the most. We're going to continue the MTSS process with Jenny, which Jenny kind of leads. Um, and MTSS is doing this stuff, but really focusing on the individual. Where SEL is maybe focusing on the whole student population. MTSS is really digging on that individual and making a plan for them. And what and what that how we can best meet their needs. And then the biggest thing that comes down to this, you've already heard us say it is attendance. You know, attendance, we 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 need students at school, students need to be at school, be at school. And how do you get them? And the number one thing, and it's 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 uh, you know one of those duh things, it's finding a way, finding why a kid would want to be at school in the first place. What is that thing? We need to find that out for every single kid in our high school. What is it that makes them want to be here or what makes them not want to be here and, and, and figure that out so that we can move forward. I think this lastly here, um, what are these benefits? What are the benefits of doing all this in the first place? Uh, it builds resiliency in students. Um, whenever students, especially teenagers, and I know that some, some of you guys have teenagers, um, they can be really bold headed and strong minded. Um, no. <laughs> It happens. Um, so we, we, we want to work with them so they can re, re, be resilient. How do we do that? We need them to have a say. They need to have a say in things that are going on. And by doing this, gives them gives them definitely a, a say. Um, and in that say, how do they resolve issues that they're going to have forever in their adult lives, like resolving conflicts, um, communication skills that they're, that they're going to need in future life? And then ultimately, we want to build really good, confident kids who are confident in themselves and in confident and have confidence in moving forward with whatever would, life entails for them. I would add kind as well, because I do think that um, doing this practice really does make them open their eyes to uh, there's, there's life beyond my, my own and everyone is going through a different you know struggle, right? And it's um, and it's good to know that as a person. So 
And to do all of that, we only need to borrow fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> not a good time. <laughs> so that's just something we're something we're excited about at the high school. Something that we see is making a difference um, in our kids. It's 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 not directly related to the education. It's not directly related to test scores. It's not directly related to their grades. But I can promise you, it has an outcome on all of those. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts or anything for Jenny? Uh, uh, I, do, I think that's great. I think a lot of these things are, are great questions to ask, just reflecting on my own teenagers, which you know very well, um, and, you know, motivating them. And, you know, they're just so unique in what makes them tick. So it's, it's you know, that's a lot of information and data to go through, but I think that um, we'll be better for it in the end, understanding some of these things. I agree. I think that personal connection that yeah you're mm -hmm. focusing on is amazing because uh, like, I think some kids just want to go to school because of that personal connection mm -hmm. with someone, maybe so, it's a teacher, maybe it's a friend, but. Well, and some don't because they don't have it. Right. right. Oh, go ahead, no, go ahead. Um, uh, in your acronym, you had SEL and MTSF. What is MTSF? It's a, it stands for multi-tiered system oh, support. Okay. And so it's just a, um, it's like we have tier one instruction, which is all of our instruction um, that we all do. And then tier two is more, um, it, it's kind of where MTSS might come into play. So we're looking for those kids that the tier one instruction is not quite working for them. And so we might put some interventions in place um, with a smaller group. And then tier three is like, it's, very intensive because we, we're, it's the, even that tier two instruction is working for them. So in tier two, mm -hmm. we put together a, a class this year, kind of like a directed study type class just for those students that we've identified can really use that support. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Jenny's been a huge part, part of that and actually does the class. And it's, uh, I, I think it's shown some really great rewards of it. The attendance has gone up drastically since last year with those students. So that's exciting. The grades were working on them. <laughs> but one thing at a time. <laughs> just one comment. I just wanted to um, uh, comment. I appreciate the thought of the, you know, the elementary student, you know, the teacher has the student the whole entire day and has that opportunity to build the relationship with that student. Conversely, in high school, or even the junior high, you know, they're changing classes and they don't have that time. And um, I, I just really appreciate that thought process. And it's so real. And it's, I, I love that we're zeroing in on that relational thing for the our high schoolers and junior high. Appreciate that. And toward that point, and I know you're here, obviously, the high school report, I get it. But, um, you know, to, and I don't know the extent to which the same practices are, are being applied or developed in middle school, for example, toward the same point, change is highlighted of, you know, switching classes and all, or even as appropriate, age appropriate, um, even lower, despite having the class culture developed by having them all day. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know to what extent it exists school wide, but it seems, um, Appropriate. So I'd love to learn more about how sort of practices are in place, particularly for the middle school, for the reasons already said. Mm -hmm. I'd love to work with you on it. It's a passion mm -hmm. of mine. <laughs> Thank you for having right. that passion. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time. Thank you. So next is public comments and questions. Do we have any online? We have none out in the um, fall. I have none online here. Okay. All right. Uh, and then, so, and that question is the approval of the consent agenda. Can I get a motion? Move the Brandon Board of Education approve the consent agenda as presented. For any discussion? Can I get a roll call vote? Jane? Yes. 
Here. Yes. Lisa? Yes. Hillary? Yes. Yeah. Rebecca? Yes. Okay, approved. Um, all right, information discussion items, board report. Do we have any board? Don't have anything on there. Okay. Finance report. Okay. Tonight, I want to talk about and give you the opportunity to ask questions on the um, four award bid award recommendations that are part of our action items. I'd like to thank um, <laughs> for coming tonight and Mark. They were instrumental. Um, the three of us worked on these RFPs, and developing an RFP is a big process. So uh, it's really important to get that right uh, with, uh, with Jeremy. But they were instrumental in helping to make sure we got the exact correct RFP. Um, Mark Spencer is here from Digital Age Technologies. He will be, um, we are recommending DAT um, to be approved to implement a new PA system district wide. And then John Tutali is here from um, ABT. He spoke to the board, uh, I believe, two months ago. Um, we had a lengthy discussion, so I know that you're familiar with the project, but I'll um, ask John to come in case there were any follow up questions. And uh, Rachel's here too, listening, and she's part of the team. So we bounce things off of Rachel, and she helps get her input uh, as part of the operations department. So first, I want to go with the painting. The painting vendor is available on the cell phone, he told me. So um, we uh, put the bid out. We have um, three bidders. Uh, we uh, reviewed the bids. The low bid was Benning's painting. So Mark and I interviewed um, Brandon Benning, Benning's from Benning's painting and uh, his partner. I can't think of his name right now. We were very impressed. Mark had actually uh, walked Brandon around the high school gym a couple times. Uh, very conscientious, asked a lot of questions. Um, we were very impressed, had no qualms whatsoever in recommending Benning's painting in the amount of uh, $69,936 to uh, our high school gym. Uh, they can start early May. The demolition is taking place in May, but there's going to be and, uh, some <laughs> Going to discuss, make sure that uh, the demolition crew for the bleachers and the painting crew are not like each other's way. Um, they're bringing out four guys, and he said about six weeks, Mark, and they about six weeks, which, which surprised me. That's that's a long time. So um, that's the recommendation. Do you have any questions on the paint recommendation before I proceed? So just to be clear, the paint is not coming out of bond funds. That's correct. I'm recommending, I, um, I've got some really solid numbers for this year's budget, which I'll be presenting in June. Um, we do have the, um, I, I'm recommending that we use general fund dollars to pay for the paint job. Is this included the cost of the paint and all materials? Yes, everything. It's yes, all in. Yes, that's everything. Okay. And there is a small group that's going to be in our board president um, and superintendent um, reviewing the, um, the color scheme and that type of thing. But basically, basically it's going to be white epoxy on the walls, maybe some brand of blue in there. The ceiling will be white. Um, and then the lettering will be black. But there could be a little variation there, but nothing drastic. And I know that um, Jesse is looking at new, taking the flags down or the banners, whatever, they're kind of tattered and torn. So the gym and the bleachers and the paint is going to have a really brand new makeover. Mark, did you want to add anything? No, um, the, the list of uh, uh, references that yeah. the folks gave us were very, very impressive. They've done uh, work for Kettering University, U of M. Uh, Flint and Ann Arbor. Um, so their, their, their list of references were very pronounced. So two pages, two pages. Two pages. So they've been in business for 40 years. Thank you for bringing it up. So um, again, we really, really felt confident that this one, it wasn't like, well, the low bid, maybe we should go with them. They just, they really seemed um, really on the ball. So, okay. We go there and we'll yeah. move on to the next recommendation is for um, our increased security measures statewide. And again, we worked on the RFP, uh, the group did with Jeremy Motes. Uh, we solicited bids and we received one bid um, from um, ADT. 
and uh, that bid was in the amount of $107,799. Um, prior to the bid here, we had really um, talked with them quite a bit about the scope, so we really understood what um, what was going to um, be installed and, and the improvements that were upgrades that were going to be made. So we did not interview him after the bid, but we did a lot of that um, just to understand the scope of work. Um, we feel he is currently in the district, so this is a good fit. We feel that um, this will go, uh, the implementation will be seamless. It will be done this summer. And so I feel good recommending them for um, increased security measures. This is the only one out of the three that we will be funding out of the bond project. The voted bond. So that's adding the 37000 there. Any questions, um, Thomas or Mark? Do you want to add anything to that? We did this. We were all involved in this. Um, I know that, you know, we spoke quite a bit a couple months ago. Great. Okay, the last one, I'm going to take a couple more minutes. Um, PA system. The, um, we received, we had a Analysis done and the PA system could use some upgrades, so the board approved a block for bid. Um, we had some quotes, and the quotes came in quite high. Fortunately, the actual bid, we had one bidder, and that's on Digital Age Technologies, DAT. DAT was awarded the bid for our um, classroom um, screens, the, 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 the technology upgrades. <laughs> so they are currently in the district. Uh, already starting the upgrades. They've been doing that since before spring break. They bid on this project. The bid came in for three buildings at 164, 436, which I was really surprised was that low. Um, this is going to give a state of the art PA system, district wide. The connection, the, um, the I think the principals are going to love it. It's the equipment's brand new, it's all state of the art. Um, in fact, we were talking when we interviewed Mark, he brought up right, and I'm like, well, if Matt Outlaw's doing it, I know, because he's totally into, <laughs> into the uh, best technology out there. So um, what I want to add to the DAT recommendation, uh, we originally were not um, soliciting bids for Oakwood, because Oakwood's equipment, even though it's 15 years old, is new compared to the high school, middle school, and the RV. But we wanted to add the ability, this came up in the interview book, to integrate or interface the um, PAC system with the new classroom screens. Correct me if I'm getting into technology stuff here, not with my uh, expertise, but the, in order to be able to do that, which again is a step up, we would have to um, update, if we didn't update Oakwood, they would not have the same ability that the rest of the buildings. So, Tonight, the award, there's two separate award, um, award action items. One is for the Oakwood and the other is for the um, first three. But talking with the team, we really feel strongly that every building should have the same modern best equipment. So the additional Oakwood upgrade is $43,000. And that, and, you know, again, it's at 15 years old, it's not exactly new, but okay. and they do need some additional so we can. Uh, can attest to they certainly this is not uh, money that would be wasted that would be um, upgraded equipment at Oakwood. So um, I would like to suggest that we fund this if the board approves all of our um, bell and proceeds that we do need to spend. I've been sort of holding on to it. We're supposed to have that money spent. We do have the money in there to fund the complete um, system, every building uh, PA system upgrade. Any questions for John or Mark or Thomas? So what's the total? 203 uh, papers, 203, I'm sorry, 207,493. That would include Oakwood. And that would be funded out of Bellion proceeds, would not affect the voted one. Right, like shoot. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the, the first um, chart or uh, amount for the upgrade 
on the first PA system, 164? Yeah, the 164, 436. Mm -hmm. They had this for a high school, the middle right. school, and Harvey Swanson. Those three buildings were recommended in the report. We had a report done that said, you know, right. equipment report. And so those three buildings were recommended. And when I originally asked the board for approval to go um, for an RFP, it was for those three buildings. Right and through the process so that's why there's two separate action items yeah these motions need to have a specific I wrote we don't down. usually i wrote it down right okay. but as, as far as an action just comes the others oh okay. mm -hmm. that was maria yeah do these action items have to have the specific amounts like the other ones if you would like it to Yes, but no, you they do don't have to. Have to okay. Yeah, they are attachment okay. and okay. Okay. it says as a design okay. Okay. And we've done that in the past. We've done it. Right. So okay. We don't need it. Okay, there's no more questions. Thank you. Wait, any questions? Question. Okay, so sorry. That's okay. Is there a service contract that accompanies the purchase? Yes, we have warranty on the equipment. The and warranty is five years, and that's labor and material, so there's no need for a service contract unless you want to be on. Five okay. years. Okay. And that comes within the purchase price. That's correct. That's correct. Nice. So there's no monthly, there's no monthly, no monthly subscription or no. There is a monthly fee on the um, monitoring fee for ABT. It okay. includes the uh, service. Okay. And that would be standard in any contract. Right. The monitoring, if there was an alarm, ABT would get that as well as our, um, our security force. Okay. As well. So the Right. And we're also going to do Harvey Swanson right away because I guess that system is almost dead. Well, so actually, we're the going plan to do is that right away. Um, yeah, thank you. That Mark said that may be done in May, which yep. is like a month away. So um, Harvey Swanson's will be done. And that's another advantage. All buildings would be done this summer. Originally, when we were talking about this, we thought, well, there was no way that we would get all buildings done this summer. But because they're in here anyway, it's allowing um, us to have the projects completed. And I can say with certainty that if we were to bid this out alone at some point in the future, um, we would not have the advantage. They were already in the building, so the cost would be higher. Actually, Brandon is my district where I started AB. <laughs> I put that board up myself. <laughs> Okay, we all go. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. All right, so we have our action items now. Um, our first is approval, approval of human resource reports. And I get motion. Will the Brandon Board of Education approve the human resource report as presented? Any discussion? Any discussion? Okay, we'll call vote. Yes. Her. Yes. Lisa. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Next, approval of BHS gym painting recommendation. The Brandon Board of Education approved the BHS gym painting recommendation to award the bid to Bennings Painting in the amount not to exceed $69,936 as presented. Support. Any discussion? Can I get a roll call vote? Jane? Yes. Her. Yes. Lisa? Yes. Hillary? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Rebecca? Yes. Approval of building security system upgrades recommendation. Move the board, Brandon Board of Education approve the building security system upgrades recommendation to award the bid to ADT commercial and the amount not to exceed $107,799 as presented. Support. Any discussion? I get a roll call vote. Hillary. Yes. Lisa. Yes. Her. Yes. Jane. Yes. yes. Rebecca. Yes. Approval of PA system recommendation. Move the Brandon Board of Education approve the PA system recommendation to award a bid of two digital age technologies for a PA system for BHS, BMS, and HSC as presented. Support. Any discussion? Can I get a roll call vote? Jane. Yes. Herb. 
Yes. Lisa. Yes. Hillary. Yes. Yes. Rebecca. Yes. Approval of PA system alternate bid recommendation. Move the Brandon Board of Education to approve the PA system alternate bid recommendation to award the bid to Digital Age Technologies for PA system upgrade at Oakwood Elementary as presented. Support. Any discussion? Can I get a roll call vote? Jane. Yes. Herb. Yes. Lisa. Yes. Hillary. Yes. Rebecca. Yes. Award contract for furniture for Harvey Swanson. The Brandon Board of Education approved the Associates Inc. Architects recommendation to purchase furniture for Harvey Swanson from Interior Image and School Specialty as presented. Support. Any discussion? Any roll call vote? Jane. Yes. Herb. Yes. Lisa. Yes. Hillary. Yes. Yes. Next is citizen input. No one here. No one out. So that is it. And I guess we are officially adjourned at 8 15.